Welcome to the Natural History Cupboard. Come on in. And welcome back to the Natural History Cupboard podcast, the place where the weird and wonderful parts of the natural world come together. I'm your host, Gareth, and with me, as always, is my co-host, Aaron. Aaron, say hi. At last, we will reveal ourselves to the Jedi. At last, we will have revenge. No, you can't do that. That's that's why they put that restraining order on you. <laughs> it always sounded wrong, that. <laughs> anyway, what have you been up to? Um, Other than that, revealing yourself to the Jedi, which... You can probably tell I've been watching a lot of Star Wars clips out of context. Of course, apparently. Um, <laughs> family guy, too. Um, but we won't, won't re-quote those. Um, I've actually not been up to a great deal uh, wildlife-wise this week. Um trying to think if there has been anything do you know what the only thing that i can think of in natural history it's not wildlife but natural history is i have been doing when weather is allowed a little bit of stargazing because you can did you, i was gonna see. say did you manage to do any uh you said you were gonna look for the perseid meteor well meteor like, share? do you know what actually good i'm glad you reminded me of that because i was about to say uh obviously last time i'd seen some and i was gonna go out after we recorded and i'll come back to that in a minute but i have seen like obviously we're still passing by it's just yeah, the, yeah. Peak, the peak is gone so i've seen a few uh throughout the week when when weather's allowed i'm glad you reminded me of that because i saw something uh that i haven't seen since i was a teen um and that was it impressed me then and i thought i'd never see it again and it was this meteor that i remember we were down Saunton Sands. We were camping, which we shouldn't have been, but it was like, this is like 20 years ago. So back in the day, aging myself there. Um, we're camping, big group of friends, lovely set up. And me and one of my friends, Mark, we walked away to see if we could spot the, the Perseid meteor shower. And we saw a lot. But one of them, we saw this bright whitish blue streak across the sky. And then it like kind of, it was almost like it hit the atmosphere and this green kind of whoosh kind of um uh, which i don't know enough about stars yeah, to yeah, know what it yeah. was so again dun, dun, dun. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. no that was that was jeff wayne's war of the worlds oh ah oh, didn't get that <sighs> reference did i oh fail failed my sci-fi friends there um but yeah i saw it after we recorded i, I went out uh stargaze for a bit and i saw the same phenomena and i uh -huh. i I need to work. I need to look into what that is, but um, it was really cool to see it again because I never thought I saw, I'd see that again. Well, so, the yeah. aliens attack. We know what it is then. Yeah, yeah, it's the yeah Death Star. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. So, what about you? My week has been taken up mostly with. Have you ever watched any of those sort of shows, uh, like moving shows? You know, like where it's uh, or like um. Like those extreme makeover shows where they, you know, they'll they'll have a house changing rooms. One yeah, day. that that sort of thing. Basically, we have been moving from one animal center mm, to another. Yeah, yeah, and we got given the grand total of two days oh, to wow. get everything out and moved. So, with almost baffling levels of military like precision, our quite small team of five of us. We managed to move all of the animals, all of the enclosures. We had movers and everything, so we're directing people where to go, where to put mm. stuff um, into the new centre, which in itself is only 100 foot away, you know, from, from the old centre. But even moving stuff from there to there requires an awful lot of uh, planning, yeah. forethought. You know, fish tanks have got to be drained and then refilled and then shift it, you know, so the whole thing. The the, the logistics of what you're it's what you're explaining, the, the health and safety for you guys, the safety and welfare of the, the animals. animals. Yeah. I have to say, I'm not going to say what my opinion is, because obviously it's, it's your job, but I do have an opinion on that. Go on then. Uh, no, no, because I, I don't want to, I don't want to get you in any sort of trouble for being associated with me. Um, <laughs> but will, I will say two days is, I it's... have an opinion on that. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not what we would have wanted. We would have wanted a much longer period of time um, for the simple reason to set things up properly, to do things, you know, far more uh, precision. But um, I would guess that that deadline had to have come from someone who isn't. 
Oh, it's animal got care. zero animal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, no, yeah it's got I, zero I, animal care or animal uh, husbandry knowledge. So yes, as someone who is who had a like near fifteen year career in animal care professionally, um, there are I far too many people. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, no, we 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 did it. We moved, um, and in the process, the the first two days, like the first actual moving of everything was quite panicky you know not not panic we weren't all running around like headless chickens but it was very sort of go 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 not the calm way that you should yeah. be with animals. yeah yeah yeah, yeah I get what um, you're saying. and it was very much okay that one's there brilliant that one there that one there tell the movers to bring the next thing in mm. um because i mean to be fair it meant that we didn't have to lift anything because most of us have got bad packs from years of working in the animal care industry. <laughs> and, you know, if you've got a team of movers who'll do all of that for you, brilliant. Mm. Um, so we we basically just pointed in the direction of where we want stuff. Uh, and now we're at the point where we've been setting things up and changing it around. Uh, myself and Drew, for instance, we built two enclosures within the space of about three hours which yeah, I, going, I, I, we were pretty impressed. The first one took the longest. Second one was uh, was a lot quicker because it was basically copy and paste. Um, and then we set them all up. And by the end of the day, Degus and Rats had brand new enclosures. Uh, I showed you the the reptile enclosures that we've yeah, been able to I set like up. Yeah, I like the reptile enclosure, yeah. That was shifting an entire tortoise house worth of sand yeah, I like the fact that you went deep substrate. That I mean, of course you Very, would, yeah. but it's nice to actually see. I only moved a couple of wheelbarrows that. of that. It was one of the other um, technicians uh, who did do did, did the the heavy lifting on that one. And mm. fair play to him; he was in there for hours. Um, so yeah, the the Cara Cara uh, got its brand new Avery as well. So he's he's he was absolutely stunned because the Avery he'd been in beforehand was not the best Avery. Mm, We'd no, been no. promised for a long time. He was getting a brand new Avery. And then finally, management all of a sudden just pulled their finger out. And within a, it, literally a week, we had a brand new Avery. Wow. This this really contractor really came good. in and they could not have been better uh, at doing exactly what we asked them to do. Good stuff. And it yeah. just shows that if it, if it's, you know, if someone's left to do the job and do it properly it can be done really quickly and it can be done to a high standard as well. So yeah, no, he's in there. He's got a fantastic new Avery and it's, yeah, it's, it's all looking good for, for next school year, which is not too far away now. No, no, it's not too far away. In fact, Scotland has already gone back. Yes, they have. Mm. So yeah. Yeah. Well, should we head on into the news? Let's do it. Mm. Right, well, we're into this week's news. Um, Aaron, what are we looking at? Well, every week, the weird and wonderful world of natural history offers up an embarrassment of riches when it comes to news and interesting uh, topics and subjects to discuss. And though we here at the uh, Natural History Cupboard uh, are a small team, I almost forgot who we are, <laughs> um, uh, we like to keep you guys, our fellow cupboard dwellers, up to date on the weird, wonderful, exciting, good, odd stuff. Um, yeah. <laughs> so uh without further ado let's jump on into the uh, natural history covered newsreel and dive into some of those more uh interesting topics mm. well i'm going to start things off this week uh talking about one of my favorite animals oh yeah tuatara, tuatara. yes uh this is actually an older bit of news but it still checks out um it's from the bbc uh it's actually from the 25th of july uh but it was so good that i actually wanted to talk about it but it sort of got overruled by various other ones mm. in the last couple of weeks. Uh, ancient three-eyed reptiles get new home at Chester Zoo. Um, they make it out in the article like these things have just turned up at Chester Zoo. They've actually just been moved to a brand new uh, enclosure and new house purpose-built for them. Yeah. But Chester Zoo, importantly, are the only collection in the UK uh, that have Tuatara, uh, a reptile, not a lizard, from New Zealand. Uh, and they're also the only collection that has bred them. Uh, yeah. outside of new zealand in wow. 2016 so yeah a really cool animal and we one worth going to to see um because they are just so awesome 
I didn't get to see them when I was there, but um, that, that's fine. It means another trip. Yeah. Um, so my one actually comes to us from the University of Exeter. Farmers needed for major new study to explore the feasibility of a wildcat reintroduction in Devon. So, yes, yeah, cool stuff. A team of researchers led by anthrozoologist Sean Moody of Exeter University is working with the Southwest Wildcat Project to build a better picture of population densities and behaviours of farm cats. The team is specifically asking for farmers and smallholders to take part in the study, which is part of a larger research to ascertain the viability of reintroducing the European wildcat to the Southwest. So my next one comes from Bird Guides. Uh, cages installed to help nesting ringed plovers. Oh, yeah. uh, fantastic little birds. Uh, the RSPB and Natural England uh, in Cumbria have basically put up nesting cages on certain beaches to help the population of ringed plovers, which has suffered a 37% population decrease since 1984. They're a very pretty little bird. Yeah. Uh, and they just, well, the cages help obviously protect where their nests are. Hmm. That's cool. They're ground nesting birds. That's really cool. So the next one comes to us from the Irish Times. Uh, White-tailed sea eagles win over farmers thanks to successful Irish return. Uh, something that we would hope Ooh. to see over here eventually. The first white-tailed sea eagle to grace Ireland as part of the reintroduction program was welcomed to its new home with anger, fear and discrimination. Farmers initially were concerned with stock predation. Now, oh, shocking. Yeah. Now, nearly 20 years on, and some and some of those farmers are amongst the biggest advocates for the birds' continued reintroduction, even hosting new arrivals. It's a turnaround that is massively heartwarming. Mm. Presumably, they've seen that these seagulls don't really do anything <laughs> to their stock. That they're not the demons on wings they thought they were. And they probably bring a healthy amount of tourism to their local I'd imagine area. so. So my next one's from New Scientist, and it's Endangered Skates Saved from Extinction by hatching in captivity. The Morgian skate uh, is only found in one habitat in Australia, which is under threat from human activity. No shocks mm -hmm. there. Uh, now the species has been saved by extinction uh, from extinction by being uh, hatched in captivity. Basically, they're taking the eggs from the wild, protecting the uh, the um, mermaids' purses is yep. the other way for, uh, to call them, and then releasing the baby skates once they've uh, they've hatched. That's really uh, cool. Just helping their population. Uh, stay nice and healthy. They are from uh, the coast of Tasmania, by the way. Right, right. It's another example of captive uh, captive collections uh, being instrumental. Yeah, 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 yeah. So my last uh, headline comes to us from Fizz.org. A hundred and thirty-five million-year-old marine crocodile sheds light on Cretaceous life. And this is a really cool crocodile. Uh, a newly described species of marine crocodile from Cretaceous Germany, it's not too far away really, was discovered over a century ago and yet plays an important role in the puzzle of Cretaceous life. Uh, now, I struggle to say this one as well myself. Enalio, an Enalioetes uh, schroederi was a Metriorhynchidae which is a lineage of crocodiles suited to marine lifestyles, evolving a dolphin-like body um, conformation, including smooth, scaleless skin, mm. uh, which is really interesting, uh, flippers and a tail fin. But unlike their Jurassic forebears, Inalioetes had adapted larger eyes in comparison to them and more compact uh, bony inner ear um, apparatus, suggesting the group were continuing to adapt to their marine environment and becoming faster swimmers. And that just about wraps it up for this week's instalment of the Natural History Covered Newsreel. Guys, if you at home have articles or topics of interest that you think should be covered either here in the newsreel or in the next part, which is the main topic discussion, send them on in. You can do so using any of the normal methods of getting hold of us, or you could even send a word through a skate to a Tara or a skate on a breeding program or even go back in time and send one of these really cool marine crocodiles out to, to find us. Either way, just get your message to us and we'll be sure to try and cover it here. Um, or like I said, in the main topic discussion, which is with Ooh. Gareth today. Gareth, what is it we're looking at today? I'm going to bring us all down. Oh, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Global pandemics. Oh, it's fun. So from Mongo Bay, 
uh, site I know that you like to use. I do like Mongo Bay, yeah. Um, this is the what's being her heralded as another animal apocalypse. Deadly bird flu infects hundreds of species pole to pole. Now, um, if you're in the animal industry, um, you'll be aware that bird flu is not fun. No, it's the bane of winter. Oh, yes. Uh, we Well, it's still around. Yeah, I was hasn't say, gone anywhere. The last two or three years, it stopped going away. It, it's yeah, it's not yeah. When it when it first Maybe started to rear actually. its head, um, I was still working in zoos, and it was a case of everything was locked down. Birds were shut inside. It it really impacted the welfare of a lot mm -hmm. of birds for a lot of zoos globally, and also for for private bird keepers as yeah. well. Um, it also has. I would say from the zoo industry changed a lot of zoos for for the worse in the sense that they got rid of a lot of birds. Yeah. Their and... collections have been cut down massively in some places yeah. because the modifications that need to be made were too expensive. It was easier to just not have the animal in the long run. But as we now face more and more years of, like you say, uh, continuous years of bird flu. Mm. Now, it's nowhere near as... Um, it's almost being treated a bit like COVID was. Uh, initially, everyone was very much, OK, let's make sure this doesn't spread. Let's make sure that we're doing this now properly. Now it's more like, it's, go wild. It's, it's just another, you know, it's just another flu. We just have to deal with it now. Yeah, and it's become a little bit like that, a little blasé in some ways. However, in the UK, um, I, can, I can speak for... The fact that Animal Plant and Health, otherwise known as AFA, mm. have now changed their regulations. You've got to register uh, all of your birds now. Uh, as a well, I certainly know as a as a college, we have to register our birds. So zoos will have to do the same. Yeah, yeah. Uh, collections basically, which means that they can track disease outbreak and and things a lot more easily. Hmm. Well, unfortunately, it's not just captive animals, obviously, that's having an effect on. It is wild animals that it's having a yeah. massive effect on. And uh, it's killed, well, uh, more than 95% of southern elephant seal pups uh, born in 2023 perished in the year uh, from deadly outbreaks of avian influenza. That's the other thing. You hear the word bird flu or avian influenza and you think it's just birds. But it can affect humans, it can affect other animals, and some animals are more susceptible than others. And the fact that it can jump species barriers as a yeah. an influenza is what can do some serious damage. So this is having a, um, a, a currently a huge toll on global wildlife populations, specifically in uh, the Southern Ocean. Um, it has done some really nasty damage on skewer as well as uh, storm petrel uh, populations, absolutely massively hitting them. So there's a quote in the article talking about how brown skewers and southern, pol southern polar skewers. Uh, now, I worked with a giant storm petrel, which is very similar to a skewer in that they are they're quite big uh, scavenging birds that mm. will pull apart penguins and dead seals and they're basically the cleanup crew of antarctica yeah, yeah. but they are not the birds that you tend to see get sick because they're pretty resilient yeah, to most they, things they have to be for the lifestyle that they live well, the numbers of these birds have dropped massively and they are finding uh ones that are basically sick or dying uh because of bird flu and this is really unusual for them to be seen uh there is a as a quote like saying uh, they're really tough animals, uh, and they're dying. Um, this is from Antonio uh, Casadilla, uh, director of the Spanish Polar Committee. Uh, and they, they're they basically looking at this lethal strain, uh, how it is just ripping through populations of birds, especially in the Southern Ocean at the moment. Uh, it's killed over 10,000 black-browed uh, black albatross uh, and ravaged an entire Gentoo uh, penguin colony. Uh, it's also, they've found a mass die-off of skewers, like I was saying, of over 50 birds uh, littering an island uh, and also a nesting colony of around 130 uh, birds dead as well. So it's causing mass population 
uh, die-offs. And we, we had a very similar sort of thing in the UK on um, Bass Rock with gannets. That's right, yeah. And it, it pretty much obliterated our gannet population for uh, a good number of years. Weirdly as well, it seems to have actually altered uh, a lot of them. And a lot of the birds that survived uh, being infected and you know lived through through it have ended up with this weird color mutation in their eyes oh so some no, of them not are... planet of the apes honestly it, it... <laughs> yeah planet of the gannets um, so i think it'd gannets. be far more of an interesting film that was an influence what they called that simian flu didn't they in that now we've got bird flu with <laughs> color what what go on then so they're basically their eye color has changed in in a few of them uh, I think is is it haplochromi haplochromism or haplochromia? It they look a, a little bit like you know when you get huskies that have got ah uh, like, that's uh, heterochromia heterochromia yeah yeah it it looks a bit like that but the gannets have got different coloured eyes to what they normally would mm. and it just seems to be this weird leftover but there were aerial photos taken of Bass Rock uh, the year before the year during and the year after and it goes from being this white island not because mm. of the birds. But because of the amount of poo, the guano, yeah. it is just coated in it. Bass Rock is an amazing, you know, seabird colony. It's in the middle of nowhere, and it's got all of these birds on it. But when it just, they, there were people saying that, you know, the place went silent because the yeah. birds were dead or dying, and it's horrific. Bird flu is a horrific disease that um, affects birds far worse than it does a lot of uh, other animals because their body is full of air sacs. Mammals, we just have our lungs. Birds literally breathe through their bones as well. Mm. So imagine having a cold that goes into your bones. I mean, literally, it kind of does in some ways, but you know, you know what I mean. Um, so yeah, it it's a rather sad descriptor of how bird flu has not gone away, um, even though you don't hear anything about it as much in the media. It has. Uh, they, they can't do the whole fear mongering thing now that we've just accepted it. Well, it has crossed into humans more than a few times. Mm -hmm. There was actually a person who died a couple of years back in Devon from it. That's right, yeah. Although he was a slightly mad person who had something like 80 ducks living in his house. Which... That'll do it. Yeah, uh, yeah why you'd have that many ducks in your house, I don't know, but... Um... I suspect there's respiratory <laughs> res respiratory issues there before he got the bird flu. <laughs> yeah. Not that we're laughing at no. dying, of course. Um, just, uh... I mean, if you if you like an animal, you like an animal, but, yeah, it's uh, it's not the best way to keep those sort of animals. No. So, yes, uh, unfortunately, um, sad news, uh, but be vigilant when it comes to things like that. If you feed birds at home, you can play a part in actually helping to defeat this. Make sure that you clean and disinfect any food or water areas that you have for birds. Um, and that's just taking them in once a week, giving them a scrub and then putting it out. Don't leave old food out for ages. I mean, that can attract vermin anyway. And you don't want rats turning up and, and eating your bird yeah. food. But, you know, take it away uh, and make sure that it doesn't just get eaten because that, that point of bringing all the birds in to feed in one area can help to uh, to cause disease transmission. Mm. So yeah, it's it's a it's a bit of a wake up that I think the animal care industry is going to have to take into account. Um, farming definitely has to take into account, and and also um, for disease transmission as well. For for humans, we need to take into account as well. Wonder um, what's going to come of all this because with with humans with flu colds and flu. Yes, there's the flu vaccine for us, but like there's so many vet, like strains of of mm -hmm. influenzas and stuff that that really you're just tackling the one that's kind of you can only go a with friend at a time, yeah. you know. Um, so that is it. It's a little bit worrying to think that is this how this is how it is from now on. Yeah, this... We have a we have a global economy, a global world. You can be on a plane in Shanghai in the beginning of the day and be on a, a, a you know, getting off the plane in, in Africa by the, by the evening, mm. which wouldn't have happened, you know, anywhere as much 30, 40 years ago. Mm. You've got stuff that is being shipped all the way around the world. You've got animals being shipped all the way around the world. You've got people going into areas of forest that never had people going into. Yeah. Yeah. 
you've got people, you know, interacting with animals uh, that they never interacted with before. So we have created this. Uh, I mean, bird flu would have always existed, you know, that existed in that sense. Yeah. But we have but created we the conditions to yeah. make it more and more prevalent. And unfortunately, unless we change the way that we do things, which will never happen because we'll never go back to a case of being uh, short of there being sort of end of the world style situation where everyone's living in little towns and everything. The tribes. It, it will yeah. never happen that we don't go back to being a one world community effectively so we as much as britain tried to <laughs> well yeah that's that doesn't even stop things either I so yeah i hope this is not this might be a little bit extreme but i hope i hope this is not the beginning of the end for the last of the dinosaurs <laughs> fair enough <laughs> Oh, what you mean, birds? Or you mean yeah, us? No, right, no, I think you're making a weird. Birds, yeah. Like, like, no, you know, it won't be. It whacked by an asteroid, and then the last of them is slowly taken. No, no, no. No, as I didn't think so, but I would hope not. As with any virus, you'll have some, uh, some that will come through, and will end up being stronger Natural because selection of it. as well yeah. will eventually kick in, and and the the ones that will breed will be the ones that are immune. Shall we cheer ourselves up by heading into? Uh, your creature feature. Yeah, I think it's going to be a fun one. Cool. It's the creature feature. Right, well, we're into this week's creature feature. Aaron, what are we looking at? Well, this week, Gareth, um, this is the closest I could get this creature feature to work with some numbers. Okay. So, obviously, if you're listening to this the first day that it drops, it's the 25th of August. I was trying to get this particular species on or as close to the 24th of august right now, the dates don't matter okay so you can say 8 24 if you're american or 24 8 if you're if you're british it's not actually to do the dates to do the numbers because those numbers are the, the jersey numbers of my favorite basketball player right wondered where this was going okay yeah so this is a guy who is i mean just talking about this guy you might think this creature feature is about a goat um but it's not about a goat because otherwise I'd be referencing Michael Jordan, his Royal Airness, Michael Jordan, sorry to use his proper title um, and stick with proper titles. We're not, as I say, we're not talking about him. We're talking about Lord Altitude himself, uh, Kobe Bryant, who of course wore a number eight and a number 24 jersey. Of course. I mean, how, how would you not know that? I was actually going to start this creature feature off with my Kobe Bryant jersey on over the top of my, my, um, podcast t-shirt but i forgot because i was putting i was helping to to calm to superimpose down. one on you yeah um but yeah th basically this um this species was uh it was a species that inspired uh the uh kobe Bryant uh for his very unfortunately short life um i don't know if you know anything about Kobe Bryant, no, I, I know the name. Is he dead? Is he? He died. Yeah, tragically. Wow. Day uh, the first year of COVID, the day after my birthday. So I think it was twenty sixth oh, of January. I vaguely remember something about that. Twenty. Him and his young daughter died in a tragic uh, helicopter accident. Right. Yeah. yeah. yeah terrible. Um, but yeah, he's just a player that I loved watching. One of those generational talents that you you, you probably experience it in rugby i guess or or maybe for people at home might be thinking football um one of those talents where you kind of wish you got to see live yeah um yeah so yeah very sad um uh turn of events but he was very very inspired by a particular animal uh, and it brought about this whole philosophy for him which i might may or may not go to in the, at the end just a little bit so what we're going to do is... Was this like his spirit animal or something? Yeah, I guess it was towards the end, but not in a very spiritual way. More in a, I admire that animal. And oh, okay. I want to kind of replicate that in my own life to an extent. Um, but yeah, so we're going to cast our mind's eye over to Africa. Right. Uh, the home of uh, the Mambas. Now, Gareth, how many Mambas are there? I'm just blocking the number. I know of two. Two, yeah. Uh, I'm guessing you know the green mamba green and, and the black, the black mamba. mamba. Yeah, so it's actually four. Do boom slangs count in that? No, I... but they are. They are referred to as uh, as um, as uh, vipers. Sorry, they are referred to as mambas. So uh, they are actually the eastern green 
uh, or common green or white mouthed mamba. Um, they're from kind of coastal southern and eastern Africa. You then have the western green mamba, which is from West Africa, obviously. And then you have the Jameson's mamba, which is another green species, but this time it's based in Central Africa. But its range kind of bleeds out into the West and East, uh, east uh, mamba uh, ranges. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Now, finally, the star of this week's creature feature, which you would have worked out through, if you don't know who Kobe Bryant is, you would have worked out through press of process of elimination there is um is uh the black mamba um and i as i say i might talk a little bit more about why later on uh with regards to him. but as for the snake a quick word on the name the black mamba's scientific binomial name comes to us entirely from ancient greek so it's one that i really like cool. obviously and it's a uh, dendroaspis polyleptis dendro dendro sorry dendroaspis polylepis and it can be broken down into four distinct words and we're going to see if gareth can work out what they are so dendro comes from the greek word dendron which means something to do with skin isn't it no oh no go on it means tree like rhododendron wow yeah so dendron means tree i was thinking Oh, yeah, lepidendron scale tree. Yeah, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm there. Right. Keep that in mind, though. Uh, the next word, aspis, comes from the word asp, which was the Greek word for... Serpents, vipers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. viper. Yeah. But was classically used for, for several species, not just the mambas, but in particular, actually, the uh, Egyptian the Egyptian cobra uh, was the main one that was called an asp. Now, we move on to the second part of its name, holly is presumably quite obvious and means many many yeah and then lepis you've already said what that means scale yeah yeah so the binomial name literally means uh tree viper with many scales which presumably yeah, is all right. every viper that i was gonna say <laughs> uh, no, yeah. with one scale it has one scale of one the sc entire there are, thing yeah yeah Although there is some weird, weird breeding programs with some snakes like corn snakes. Yeah, but stuff. that doesn't count. That's not. I don't problem. like that kind of thing, so we're not going to talk too much about it. Now, the common name black mamba obviously refers to its coloration, right? No, it doesn't. No, it does not. Very good, Gareth. It actually refers to the coloration of the inside of its mouth, uh, which you don't really want to get no. close enough to see, uh, to be quite honest, because uh, this snake's bite is quite dangerous. <laughs> um and we'll we'll definitely get onto that later because I like my venoms. Uh, but the word mamba itself comes from the Zulu word imamba. Mm. Now I actually joined because I can I, I didn't trust Google Translate, so I actually joined a Facebook group uh, with uh, people who speak Zulu to try and find out if there's any meaning behind the word. Right. Unfortunately, it just means mamba. <laughs> so I was hoping for some sort of uh, some Deep. sort of like. Deep meaning. Deep meaning or alternative meaning that would shed some insight into the animal. But no, it just means it just means mamba. It does, however, have a different name in Tanzania, where it's called. Um, I'm, I'm going to use my notes here because I can't pronounce this word. Uh, in Demalunyayo. In Demalunyayo. Yeah. Uh, now that is what the local Bantu speakers of the Gindo language call it and it means grass cutter because they feel like it clips the grass as it glides through hmm. yeah yeah now the, the snake obviously has a really fearsome reputation uh yeah. among people that share its natural range and people who will likely never come across it in their lives yeah um basically anyone that you talk to will know what a black mamba is and and how uh how they're terrified of it even though they never see it uh and so i feel something needs to be said to remedy that a little bit on the on this creature feature so gareth have you ever met a black mamba have you ever seen a black mamba in person? seen one I think, they them, yeah, I think they have them at chest um london zoo i i've never i've never seen them you know like yeah, yeah no, in, 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 in person but it between a pane in, of glass no no i yeah. didn't know that i didn't know that i'd have to check that and go up got, soon i'm sure they've got some mamba they definitely had um, 
uh, King Cobra, I think, or something like that. Oh, isn't it? I don't know. Their, their reptile house has got some pretty amazing their stuff. Their reptile house is good. When I went in there, it was so busy, I didn't get to see much. So That's I, uh, part of the I problem, just, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but no, that's that's good, because I did actually ask Drew, um, our former co-host who still does the artwork for us and would have done the uh, really cool Black Mamba artwork for us, which, if you pay attention, actually forms a figure of eight. Oh, is that why you were so <laughs> specific on that? Right. Because right. even though Kobe wore... Uh, the number eight and the 24 my first you're not ever... going to be able to get a snake to a 24 no no <laughs> and also my first ever jersey was was his number eight jersey right so, yeah so yeah that's where the black mamba is in a figure eight on in the artwork oh there's cryptic meaning <laughs> yeah. in all of our pictures. there is um so yeah this is probably uh, anyway sorry I was, I was about to say yeah i asked drew because drew's actually spent time in africa and he's never seen one no. Uh, and I don't believe he's seen one in captivity either. I could swear that I've seen him in London Zoo, the, but I could be wrong. He did tell me, however, that he saw a puff adder, a dead puff adder, unfortunately. But yeah. More um, dangerous in some ways. More confirmed yes. kills than. Yes, than more confirmed others. kills, that's true. Um, yeah, but yeah, as I was about to say, this snake is probably the most feared snake on the planet. Uh, if you ask anyone what the most dangerous snake in the world is, it's likely that. Some of them will probably name Black Mamba. Um, not necessarily the most dangerous or the most venomous, but yeah, it's the one that they'll 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 name. Um, and it's certainly the most feared snake in Africa, uh, mm. and its reputation is huge, <laughs> <laughs> and and also undeserved. Yeah. So they are considered large, hyper aggressive, prone to give chase and armed with extremely overpowered venom. And only two of these things are, are actually really true. Um, so whilst the snake is large, more on that later, uh, they are only ever really a threat when they're cornered or trapped or frightened by by a person um, who is probably just as frightened, to be honest. Uh, despite uh, plenty of fear-mongering chase stories, these snakes do their absolute utmost to uh to avoid us at all costs so in reality the black mambas are a nervous species with a recognizable threat display so you would you would definitely uh realize when this snake is trying to tell you to back off mm. um and this means that more often than not the like bite incidents are actually avoided uh in fact other species are far more likely to bite you which is where what gareth said the snail comes into it because the puff adder they're lazy yeah, the puff adder is is a is far more likely to bite you. So pushing myths to one side. Actually, before I do move on from that, I did just want to add because I don't think I come on to it. The reason why people think black mumbas chase you is because usually, just sheer coincidence, the person finds themselves between the black mamba and its home. Yeah. And so the black member is actually trying to retreat at speed, trying to get away, and you're kind of backing up and doing that whole thing. You know, when you bump into someone else, you're like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, you're kind of doing that, but with an extremely venomous and dangerous snake. So yeah, we'll push the myths to one side. There is actually legitimate cause for concern should you happen upon a black member. They are very active diurnal predators, so 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 they're going to be hunting when you are active too. Um, and they are, unlike their arboreal green relatives, just as comfortable and at home on the ground as they are up in the trees. Uh, the green mambas are far more likely up in the trees. That's where they hunt. Most of their prey is bird, bait, yeah. bird kind of uh, prey stuff. Uh, whereas the black mamba is... Um, is Rodents, I'm guessing, on the ground? Yeah, and he's very very terrestrial snake. Um, but yeah, at home in the trees too. Uh, they also don't tend to strike once, black mambas. They will oh. strike multiple times. Um, and in their bite, um, from the moment they hatch, they've got uh, one to six drops of venom in in their in in each each Blend, fan. Yeah. By the time they're adults, they've got uh, between ten and twenty drops. So that's a lot of venom, and only two drops of it can can kill a person. Oh, well, you so, know, if you're going to kill someone, make sure that they're definitely, definitely dead. Yeah. They're, they're, so <laughs> definitely, even though their reputation is is blown out of proportion, definitely still one best avoided um, and enjoyed from a very, 
safe distance. Yeah. Um, so I mentioned before that the name doesn't refer to the color of the main body, but in fact the mouth. So we're going to dive into what black mambas actually look like. So as I said, they are a large species. Um, do you know how large before I say? I'm going to say that they can get upwards of six foot. Oh, I should say so. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah. These Ten? guys... Oh, actually, yeah, probably less. Oh, no? A bit okay. more. Yeah, yeah, a bit more. So they're often between nine and 12 foot, but oh, wow. but larger specimen, specimens can actually push 15 foot. They are, in fact, the, the second largest venomous snake after the king cobra. Yeah. Now, the green um mambas at, at their longest get nine foot so the black oh. mamba is is very much larger than its 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 closest relatives um so yeah routinely grown over nine foot and a heavy girth to boot i heard i one video i watched in preparation for this actually mentioned that they'll get the size of like a, a, a the average person's arm in terms of girth so that's a chunky snake it is a chunky snake and you don't really get a good picture of that from photographs no but then again photographs of snakes are very misleading i've been showing atta my partner uh, all these images of green tree pythons and emerald tree boas lately mm. and you really don't get some of them look huge and it's actually a relatively small snake and some and then again some of them look tiny and they're, they're actually giant they're actually yeah bigger than, yeah. than what they they seem so yeah this is a huge venomous snake and they are not a black scaled species either sort of gray yeah yeah in fact the coloration varies greatly from from olive uh through to khaki and sometimes gray um it's ve it's actually very rare to actually get a truly black scaled specimen um th these other colors are far more common and the underside is paler almost white but not quite um and also to an extent thinking about it, the body if you some of the photos of the close close up photos, you can actually see an almost iridescence kind of mm. sheen to it. So yeah, there's there's that too. It's not a pure black animal. The head is quite angular, um, and it has a very pronounced brow. Um, the eyes range from brown to grey, uh, and and black with um with like a silver or yellow kind of um flecking. Yeah, just around the around the pupils there, um, and the mouth, as previously stated, is black or near black. Sometimes it's a bluish hue, but it's it's very very dark. And as I mentioned, where the green mambas can be found, um, I didn't actually mention where you can find the black mamba. So Gareth, would you like to take a shot at that? I will say that their range is pretty vast. Oh God, my African geography is somewhat atrocious. Um. <laughs> I mean, I could point out a few different places. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a guess that they're more, so sort of, southern Africa, mm -hmm. up through Zimbabwe, maybe up as far as like Malawi or Uganda. Do you know what you've you've done pretty well? You've I've just done gone a straight well. line up as far as I can think. Yeah, and for that reason, I am actually going to go ahead with my list. Here Grassland, got... basically. Like savannah grassland. Oh, we're getting into habitats. Very good. Yeah. In alphabetical order, I'll list off the countries because it is vast. And you'll see how that central line is very is very accurate, but it bleeds out quite a bit. Oh, I was gonna say, looking at your looking at what you've got there. So and off that way and yeah, much you, further up what? that way. That, that that's yeah. a bit of everything, really. Yeah, they 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 do inhabit quite a bit of Africa. So you got Angola, Botswana, Burkina Faso, uh, Burundi, Cameroon, Central African Republic, Democratic Republic of Congo, Eritrea, Eswatini, uh, Ethiopia, Kenya, Malawi, Mozambique, um, Namibia, Rwanda, Somalia, South Africa, South Sudan, Tanzania. I could have said pretty much anywhere in Africa then. You could have done, yeah. That's mostly like sub-Saharan. Yes, it is. And that's the key point. So the other three, Uganda, Zambia, which you did name, Zambia and Zimbabwe, which you also named. Um, and Gareth just nailed it. They are sub-Saharan. So you won't find these guys along what you would consider, let's say, Mediterranean Africa. Well, yeah, Libya. Um, Egypt, uh, Morocco. Yeah, Algiers, yeah. 
Yeah, so it's definitely sub-Saharan Africa, and it's quite a range. Now, in these range countries, the species prefer light wooded environments with scrub and rocky habitats, but it can also be found in semi-arid uh, savannas, moist savannas, and even in lowland forest biomes. Um, so Gareth, I don't think this creature feature adventure will be too dangerous for you. We're not going to put you in, <laughs> not going to put you in harm's way in this case. It's going to be more of a multiple choice exam. Um, than a, than an actual uh, you taking on the the animal uh, the animal spirit, but let's test you nonetheless. So, first question: uh, Where in these habitats would you be living? Uh, a a tree hollow, B a leaf litter mound, C a rotten log, or D a burrow. I'm gonna go with a burrow. Very good. Yeah. So this is actually a permanent home that you've made for yourself. No. Oh. So black mambas will will will, uh, will have a burrow, and they will stay there unless it's substantially disturbed, uh, presumably by predators or or people mainly. Uh, secondly, do you recall your daily activity pattern? Are you diurnal, nocturnal, crepuscular, or um, what was the other one? Uh, Cathemeral. Definitely diurnal. Yes, you are diurnal. That's one of the reasons why you're so dangerous uh, to people. Um, now, this is not multiple choice this question what prey are you out to catch well i would imagine rodents mm -hmm. reptiles it being the day mm -hmm. so it's lizards and the like uh possibly ground nesting birds yeah so not that too bad i don't think other snakes would feature on their their list heavily no no because um... i think their venom's mostly built for taking down mammals that's correct. Yeah, very good. Impressive. Most impressive. Uh, so the only thing that I would pull you up on is is other reptiles as well. These guys, and you kind of nailed it there, they mainly, they they, they really do prefer, with the exception of birds, mm. they really do prefer mammals. The reason why birds fall into that, even though they're technically reptiles, yeah, is they're yeah. warm-blooded. These guys much prefer warm-blooded meals, and that's actually kind of what their venom is built for. So you're looking at bats, birds, bush babies, rodents, and for the larger specimens, even the odd hyrax. So pretty, uh, pretty yeah. good, yeah. Um, so what predators do you think you'll be avoiding? Uh, well, in all of those places, I mean, you've got a good list there. So I would imagine leopards. Oh, no, actually, no, no the, n the number one, I'm going to say honey badger, hands down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nothing messes with the honey badger, and <laughs> I can imagine they'd probably even sleep off their venom. Um, I would say leopards, hyenas, jackals, probably birds of prey, something like a varro eagle. Um, uh, trying to think that range. What else? Hyenas, maybe. I think you already said hyenas, but yeah, you've, yeah. You've you've basically any predator. That is, I, I, other than I would say a honey badger, mm -hmm. any of those would be sort of like predators that would just take a chance, but realize how dangerous the animal. I mean, I think leopards are smart enough to realize how dangerous the prey is. Yeah. There are hyenas, um, birds of prey. It might just be a case of they'll give it a go. Oh, secretary birds, definitely, especially uh, if they're younger. Yeah, well. Actually, the larger predators don't come up on, on on most lists, but I would assume that they do take them if they, if they can. It just seems to be that these larger predators avoid them. I guess they're because they they're know not the as, danger. They know the danger, yeah, and they're they're not as easy or as safe a target as you know a small or well, medium sized mammal or a bit large sized mammal. Anyway, uh, what you'd be looking out for is brown snake eagles. Uh, I know there'll yeah. be some eagle on there. Cape file snakes. Okay. Them. Uh ground hornbills, which we've both yeah, worked with, I and I was really chuffed to see not that I, I I'm not rooting for anybody, but when you've worked with an animal and you oh, know no, that you they get... can take on something like a, a black mamba, you always root for the hornbill. And the hornbills are just so cool, aren't they? Yeah. They're incredibly fact, cool. They they will be a creature feature, I think, for me they in the future. Be, yeah. yeah. Um honey badgers, which you mentioned, hooded vultures, marsh owls, martial eagles, mongoose, uh Tawny eagles, and what might surprise you is Nile crocodiles. No, that wouldn't surprise no. me in the slightest. So they have been found with uh, black mamba remains in there. If, in there. If it goes Some in else. the water, it's fair, uh, fair prey. 
Yes, this is true. <laughs> uh, but most interestingly of, of that list, mm. uh, for me, and you touched on it, is the honey badgers and the mongooses. Yeah. Because they have an element of resilience Immunity. to the yeah. ve venom. And the reason for this is that the receptors in their muscles don't seem to bind with the uh, the, the neurotoxins, well, yeah. um, the, the neurotoxic components of the venom. So that's a really cool thing, and that's where we're going to kind of jump on to uh, to to the venom itself now, because what a venom! <laughs> it's mostly neurotoxic, but there is a hematoxic element to it. Um, now the snake is both agile and fast, reaching speeds of up to twelve miles per hour, but when it hunts, it often does so at a crawl uh, before ambushing its prey with multiple strikes. Like I said, delivering it, 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 incredible unique uh, killer chemical uh the venom causes a tingling sensation and um a metallic taste to begin with oh. now these will be followed over the course of the next 10 minutes by excessive constriction of your pupils um loss of motor control over your your eyelids uh inability to talk breathe or swallow you'll get muscle spasms loss of bodily motor control so you you won't be able to control your body movements all that well uh you, you'll start getting dizzy you'll get vertigo uh you'll uh, you'll then within about 45 minutes you'll lose consciousness um and without immediate medical treatment um you, you you'll be in a lot of trouble you need the the you need the appropriate anti-venom um to stave off death which would occur within 15 hours Oh, fun. So you need to get yourself to a doctor if you're bit by a black mamba. Uh, and you need to get to one that has the antivenom because not all hospitals have the antivenom. Yeah. Um, and it's really important with this one because when I say the appropriate antivenom, I mean black mamba specific monovalent uh, antivenom because these bites cannot be treated by polyvalent uh, antivenoms. So poly polyvalent just tell you what that means is snake venoms that are sorry anti-venoms that are, are um generalized for snakes there mm. are some snake bites that are so similar to each other that they can be treated by kind of a catch-all um multi-snake anti-venom black mambas are not one of them they have a specific anti-venom for to treat them so uh yeah you have to get that one it was created in 1962 and since then it has drastically reduced the number of deaths caused by this snake if i remember the statistic i think before 1962 uh 15 out of 32 bites would would end in death Oof. even if treated by antivenom after 1962 i think it went down to i never I it went down to like two out of 32 deaths or something like that if i remember correctly as well if you've had a certain type of antivenom you get bitten again you can't have yeah, the that, same thing that's because it that's potentially right. could kill you yeah that's, so as a general rule right. don't go and pick up a black man but that's a really bad idea and especially if you've is. already been treated for it definitely, definitely don't do avoid it again. if you've already if you've been bitten by a black member and taken the anti-venom i would suggest moving Get yeah, out probably. of Africa. Yeah. Get out of Africa. And don't work uh, with a, a, a venomous snake department in a zoo anywhere. You know what? It would be interesting, actually, having uh, worked in zoos. I've never worked with venomous snakes in that sort of sense. But it'd be interesting to know the protocols. Because I, I can honestly say I don't think there's been many people bitten by venomous snakes in UK mm -hmm. zoos. Because the health and safety is that good. But it'd be interesting to know the protocol that if you were bitten and had the antivenom ad administered, would you be able to then work with those snakes mm, again? Yeah. I do know someone who got bit by a venomous snake yeah. in captivity. Yeah. So I won't name names, but there used to be a shop, a local pet shop when I was ah, in... This is, school. say, it's not a zoo. No, not a zoo. This is in a pet shop, exotic pet shop. Uh, used to be in the local town. Um, and he kept i believe it was coral cobras hatchlings and um then he moved his shop to another city i'm not going to say where because i mm -hmm. don't want to narrow it down for anyone but he actually was feeding these guys bear in mind when i saw them they were hatchlings and this incident didn't take long didn't didn't happen long after he got bit on his ring finger and he was so lucky that there was a police car passing the shop 
and his um assistant had the the wits about him to run out of the shop and flag down the next driver, which happened to be this police car. He got to hospital in time and he he just has a stub for a for a ring finger now. Oh. Um very, very lucky because that venom basically it starts in fact, this is something that black black mamba venom does as well. It starts the digestion the sorry, the digestion process. Yeah. Uh so it basically was starting to turn his finger into a bag of water of fluid for it. Oh. so yeah um but that is uh pretty much it on the snake for this creature feature i did want to take just a quick moment to mention this philosophy that i was talking about because i think it's important uh it's an important one for for everyone so just a very brief word on it he he called it mamba mentality don't tell me he was running around with his mouth open oh, he's biting, not biting like, <laughs> like shaquille o'neal on the arm no no it wasn't anything like that it was <laughs> He was going through a bit of a uh, for a through a few personal and professional uh, trials and struggles. Yeah. Um, and he felt like during this period he didn't really know what his place was in in the world and really in his own life. It was at this time that he was watching Kill Bill, and during that movie, uh, a character uses a black mamba to pretty fate of effect um uh, and um that kind of motivated him to look into black mambas you're gonna say to wear an all-in-one bodysuit and <laughs> travel to japan on a on a revenge mission no 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 he just uh he just yeah he liked the, the snake in the movie so he went and started looking it up and he was really impressed by the size the venom the hunting strategy and and the fact that snakes of course, all snakes shed their skin. Uh, and what he saw in that was the the metaphor to shed your own skin, shed your past okay. self to become a better self. Uh, and basically, this mentality is all about fail. Like, don't be afraid to try something like we did four seasons ago. Yeah. Don't be afraid to try something and have it fail and then use that failure as a stepping stone until you succeed. His mentality is fail and fail and fail until that thing, until you succeed at that thing, and that thing is no longer something you're trying. It's now something that's in your toolbox to to use for the future, and I think that's a really strong note on it. Um, uh, yeah. So yeah, and it's funny you mentioned about the 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 all in one suit. Uh, even though I know you meant the yellow outfit for yeah. um for Kill Bill, but the for the anniversary of Kobe Bryant and his daughter's tragic passing, the LA Lakers wore a uh, a strip that um that mimicked black mamba scales. Oh, that's cool. Um, so really cool. It's it's brought a lot of attention to the animal. Ooh. So yeah, I'm just thinking leave it there. on a <laughs> on a slightly weird note. I'm thinking in an alternate universe. You like your you know your alternate universes. He was watching something else that had to do with a different animal. So in another universe, you know, his favourite thing was the gerbil. The gerbil, yeah. Or, <laughs> I don't know, the palace cat. And, you know, that was his, his mentality. <laughs> is The grumpiest cat. Sit the there and look grumpy <laughs> and blend into the background. Apparently, I don't know how true this is, but I have heard his teammates and some of his opponents say, uh, say that, I mean, you, when you watch, you see things, but... You don't necessarily register it. Uh, I've heard it, some of his opponents, some of his teammates say that he literally would hiss at people <laughs> when he's playing <laughs> to get into their heads. <laughs> Which sports psychology is a fantastic subject, but that's not for this podcast. So we'll move on. I Fair think. enough. Well, <laughs> there you go. Right. Well, we'll sliver into the mailbag. Yep. <laughs> don't put your hands in it, though. No. <laughs> You've got mail. Ooh, it's an email. Right, well, we're into this week's emails. Uh, we're going to start things off uh, with last week's question, which was, what's the most ridiculous or funny thing you've ever seen in the ocean or the sea? Um, starting things off, Jen Babs has put, uh, I think handfish are pretty bonkers, but I've never seen one, so I don't suppose that counts. Well, I think you have to, yeah, we we see Yeah, it. we asked if, you, if you you've seen you it. You have to seen it. That's, that's cheating. But, you know, it's, yeah, it's still an interesting animal. Yeah, well, definitely, yeah. Um, and then Leah Dorr, um, 
comes to us with Carl Pilkington. I mean, she may have actually seen him in, in the sea for some reason. Yeah, I wonder if she has. Yeah, Fair enough. Tell us if you have. Uh, but to be honest, I don't really... I know who Carl Pilkington is, but I don't really... He's not renowned for being a sea creature. No. So. <laughs> uh, Danny Kevin, my soon-to-be wife trying to swim. Does that count? Now, <laughs> we had to respond to that one to just, just clarify because... We don't want him shooting himself in the foot by the sounds of it. Which I think he did by the but end of this. Very thread. much by the end of this thread. So we've uh, we've said to him, it's up to you on that one. You know, we're not we're not <laughs> going to uh, to put our necks on the line. Uh, uh, he's then replied, uh, to be fair, I did. Uh, uh, sorry, I did. A, this is Sparta to her <laughs> on off the side of a catamaran. So presumably that means the boot, right? He booted his. <laughs> He booted his wife, or soon-to-be wife, off the side of a catamaran by kicking her in the chest. So, oh, of which he tagged her in there saying, sorry. Um, we've put, oh dear. And he's she's, re she's responded. She's repl uh, replied by saying, yeah, while I had pneumonia. I think he may have just dug himself the biggest of all holes in the world possible. Yeah, this is actually awkward reading, Danny. <laughs> it is. She's then put, good job, you're, you're not a comedian, because your timing skills are poor. Of which she's then replied with chuckles, I'm in danger. <laughs> um, so that was, I think that's possibly one of the most... I'm going to say self-deprecating threads because I think also possibly the thread with too much information because <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure what's what to make of any of them. I mean, to be honest, put it this way: if the two of you end up together and are happy with the fact that you Sparta kicked your Sparta wife, Sparta kicked your wife into the, the side speed, of a cat with pneumonia, with pneumonia, and you're both absolutely fine with that, and everyone's fine and healthy, then that sounds like. It's it's you you guys are going to be together for a long time. Gareth's trying to say that we don't kink shame in the cupboard. I mean, yeah, why not? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, moving swiftly onwards. Um, Jen Babs has written back to us with what might be a little bit more of a relevant comment, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and she says, uh, "Not sure if this is the kind of thing you were hoping for, but my hubby used to go fishing, and one day the sea was quite rough, and a colleague of his was rather poorly over the side of the boat." Losing all of his full English. Oh. Um, anyway, not to worry. A gull made use of the bacon rind for its breakfast. Which you responded, gross, but it counts. And yeah, that counts. That's exactly what we're looking for. I sea think. bacon. Yeah. Sea yeah. Bacon. It's, uh, Extra salty. Basically feeding the fish. <laughs> Chum in the water. <laughs> you never know. They may have ended up with more fish coming up than they oh, would have or if they hadn't. The water. Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, they're, they're in possibly one of the least uh, oh, really? relevant, yeah, but least... also one of the most sort of eye-opening ones I think we've ever done. It's <laughs> quite, quite odd answers there. Very. <laughs> um, so based on the fact that you are, you know, you've had a slight wardrobe change in the... Uh, I'm the, now the wearing my Kobe Bryant Lakers jersey. With a, with a number eight with on it. With a number eight on it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, based on that and based on uh, Kobe Bryant's uh, personal philosophy around the Black Mamba, we're we're going with this week's question being, what animal would you base your personal philosophy on mm. and why? So, Aaron, what what animal are you going to base your personal philosophy off from this point on? Um, I'm going to say this, uh, and as saying it, I reserve the right to change my mind. Well, I think you're allowed next, to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when I've had more time to digest the question, but. I think I'm going to go with a, a dolphin. Okay. Dolphin, because, uh, you know, you live in a, a nice, tight-knit family group uh, and you surf every day um, and you get to pester people for free food. Fair enough. I'm going to base mine on the platypus. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Look weird. Be weird. Wander around looking for food. With your eyes closed all day, but you'll still find stuff. And I assume the the advantage of having a, a venomous heel kick. Yeah, you know, stab people <laughs> with your foot. Okay, well, <laughs> so, not a bad one. Why not? I yeah. like it's either that or I go with the herring gull one. You know, eat what uh, eat anything and everything. Everything is food for you, 
uh, and then poo on whatever you want. <laughs> how many people, if we put this out to the wider public, not just to our followers, how many people do you think are going to say, Wolf, because I'm an alpha? If they do, it's interaction, but... We get to comment. We get yeah, to then wrong. comment heavily on that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, what animal are you basing your personal philosophy on and why? Uh, let us know on our Facebook page or uh, wherever, um, and we will, well, we'll have a look at those next week and see interesting personal philosophies of what people have got. Maybe there's going to be, like, tardigrade, survive anything. So that'll go up on our Facebook page, uh, and that's just one of the ways that you can get in contact with us. Mm -hmm. One way that you definitely can get in contact with us is by becoming one of our Patreons, which Aaron is going to tell us about Absolutely now. Absolutely right. Every week we like to give a little love back by shouting out the names of our wonderful Patreon supporters. Now these guys are the cupboard dwellers who uh, contribute uh, financially to the to the success of the show and to, to the changes that we make. Um, and so we, we're grateful beyond words. So those people are, of course, Fogtober, Jen Greenhall, Connie P., Chelsea McKee, Nick to Nick, and Justin Knife. Guys, your financial contributions are actively helping us uh, change things around here. It's actively helping us get out and about, and we can't thank you enough. Um, now we are uh, appreciative of all of our cupboard dwellers. Like Gareth said, we can, we 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 love what you guys do for us. We'll be listening, sharing, subscribing, liking, being. Cupboard <laughs> evangelists and, and getting the word of mouth out. Uh, it's really important um because it, it helps us to no end. So if you are thinking of joining our Patreon, you think you think we've earned it, uh there are currently two tiers at which you can do that, and they are of course the nature nerds and the animal ambassadors, but more information on those at a later date, as I often say. Um and once again, thank you so much for your continued support. Mm. Uh, so, yes, a massive thank you to all of our Patreons. Uh, and like Aaron said, there are various other ways that you can help us out, not all of them financially based. Mm. You can uh, help us out massively just by, well, listening uh, or watching or however you are consuming us. Uh, maybe sort of having us channeled into your brain through some sort of weird chip chip device. I don't know. We may have got there by this point. Who knows? <laughs> um, you can uh, like, subscribe, comment on, on whatever uh podcasting or whatever platform uh, you are enjoying us on um telling a friend uh, or telling someone that you know is uh, is really important why not tell someone who is a lakers fan yeah it is the lakers isn't it it is the lakers cool got that right <laughs> i don't do basketball <laughs> i don't know the yellow do you know what this whole month could be Toby Bryant month because if you ignore the day it's still october which is the eighth month and it's 2024 so, oh, there there. You go. so just spend the whole day the whole whole month this month just or what's left of it pumping the podcast to uh other pod other lakers podcasts like tell lakers nation we're doing a black mamba uh <laughs> feature on for go to in, a lakers in game honor. and shout us out yeah 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 <laughs> do that or, or send me tickets yeah okay send yeah. me tickets why not yeah <laughs> If the if the rest of the Lakers are listening, send him send him to I'm assuming Los Angeles. It is Los Angeles. Right, okay. Yeah. Well, you're doing well. You're sports you know balling. <laughs> I sports ball. Anyway, um, that pretty much brings us to the end of this week's episode. Um, so big thank you, Aaron. No, thank you, thank That's you, and thank you, uh, thank you for listening or watching us. It was a good, it was good uh, sports ball episode. Sports ball, sports ball, good sports snake. <laughs> should have actually you should have asked drew to do like a well i don't know how you'd do it it'd be more of a sock for a snake but like a jersey on a jersey <laughs> on, on your on your black mamba i was thinking to put it on a purple background instead of a green one well you never know <laughs> but yes uh big thank you um to you at home for listening and we will see you next time here in the natural history cupboard bye one does not simply play basketball without invoking the spirit of the mamba. <laughs> <laughs>